I will worship with all of my heart. I will praise you with all of my strength. I will seek you all of my days. I will follow. Sticking with that praise theme, I'd like to start off this morning reading the 100th Psalm. I just think it's a wonderful way to start a worship service. Shout, to the, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. We welcome you this morning. Um, obviously our numbers are slightly depleted because of spring break, but we have uh, what they call qu uh, quality today instead of quantity. Uh, but I, I am glad you're here. This is a good place to be, and boy, isn't it a great place. Any place you're worshiping God's a great place to be. We do welcome you, if you're visiting with us, uh, you'll notice on the uh, bulletin you received, there's a place where you can fill out uh, your attendance. We would love to know about you. If you have any prayer requests, visitors or members, you can document those on that same thing. And then just a little bit when the offering plate comes by, you can slip your uh, attendance slip in there. Uh, we, we are interested in you. We do want to know what's going on. And if you have uh, requests, please let them be known either through that form or after service. The elders will be up here uh, through these doors here to greet you. Stand and say hi to someone standing beside us, and then we'll continue in our worship. Of the Lord will be my strength. I, I will, will not falter. I will, I will not faint. faint. He is my shepherd. I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. The 
joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. He will uphold me all of my days. I am surrounded by mercy and grace. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not waver walking by faith. To deliver me safe, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Be seated, please. In heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. Presses and hard, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord, and we sing glory. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do give you all glory for your power and strength is endless. Thank you for so many things you give us for the breath of life, for giving us such beauty in the earth, and uh, for friends, for family, for the degree of health we enjoy, for the blessings we enjoy in this community, this, this country, the endless things that we could list, Father, that come from your gracious and good and loving hand. Uh, we thank you as a group here at Twickenham, we thank you more than anything, Father, we thank you that you put our sins, that you made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin and to take on our sin. And in doing that, you gave us his righteousness. And we thank you for that righteousness, Father, that we, that we enjoy through your plan and your suffering, your sacrifice, the death of your son, and help us to live in that that righteousness, to live in that thankfulness and joy that we have in Christ, to deeply believe it and understand it. Uh, help us, Father, share that with others, to live our lives in such a way it reflects that joy and the reality of what happened in the death of Christ. We ask you as a church to be with um, our work, the things we're involved in as a church, Father. Be with missionaries this morning, the world over, their families, the suffering they go through. Give them strength and courage. 
uh, particularly the Hacienda of Hope, the, the staff that labors there, the, the joy they reflect, the love we see, and the children that um, come from their teaching, their instruction. As a church, we join our hearts together this morning to pray for, for that work, for those teachers, those individuals that labor there, and for the children themselves and the staff, the people that are uh, touched by that ministry. We pray for your direction in their lives and your, um, your, uh, your involvement in every decision that's made and help us to be a, a part of that and to, to uh, do everything we can. Father, we come together as a church uh, mindful that many, many are suffering and dealing with, with disease and with um, illness and with challenges and some we know of, some we don't. Help us now as we join our hearts together to remember those in our group who need you and need you to be very near them. And we ask you to be, be there by their side, Father, and to help them to know how close you are. Particularly, Father, I, we, we want to remember Anna Pollard in her recovery, Megan White, Linda Horton, Lloyd Brooks, Tommy Horton, Brian Price, and Jordan Coleman, and ask you to, to be with them, be with the family, their families and those that are near them, and, and help those uh, physicians involved in their treatment decisions, bless, bless their recovery. And thank you this morning, Father, as a church, for people who have worked long before we got here this morning and made special preparations uh, in so many different aspects of the things we're enjoying and participating in this morning. Uh, Thank you for their service and their time. Help us to have our hearts filled, our eyes open, and to benefit <clears throat> from the things you would have us to learn this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, and we will not perish. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. He got up rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Hide me now under your Cover me within your mighty hands. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still. Find rest, my soul, in 
Christ the Lord. No. quietness and trust when the oceans rise and thunders roar i will soar with you above the storm father you are king over the flood i will be still and know you are god when the oceans rise and I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. I will be still and know you are God. We'll sing this song before our Lord's Supper this morning. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without Thee. I dare not try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the loads of life unaided. I need Thy strength to lead myself. threaten if storms of trial burst above my head if flashing seas sleep everywhere about me they cannot haunt or make my heart afraid be with me Lord no other gift or blessing Thou couldst be so good with this one compare. A constant sense of thy abiding presence. Where'er I am to feel that thou art near. Be with me, Lord, when loneliness overtakes me. When I must sweep amid the fires of pain, and when shall come the hour of my departure for worlds unknown, O Lord, be with me then. So we've been covering compassion the last few weeks. And so I ask you, what can be more compassionate than a God who knows that we are all sinners justly deserving eternal punishment? And yet, even though he is perfect and done no wrong, he comes down and takes all of our wrongs upon himself so that we can be with him. So, as we take part in the Lord's Supper, which points to that ultimate compassionate act of sacrifice, let's thank God for what he's done for us, what we couldn't do for ourselves. Pray with me. Lord, inspire us, equip us, compel us to compassionately regard one another as more important than ourselves. Not merely looking out for our own needs, but also for the needs of others. Holy Spirit, fill us with this attitude, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
who, although he is God, did not regard equality with God as something to which to cling. But instead, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave through birth as a human being. When he appeared in human form, out of an infinitely compassionate heart, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even a shameful criminal's death on a cross. For this reason, we have salvation through his blood, by which he entered the most holy place once and for all to secure our eternal redemption and the forgiveness of all our trespasses. Because of this, God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above all names, that is, King of kings and Lord of lords, so that at the name of Jesus, we bow our knees and confess with our tongues that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe with our hearts that God raised him from the dead and thus we have salvation by his grace through faith not as a result of works but as the free gift of God and this salvation O oh God, is impossible for us as sinful human beings to accomplish. But with you, O oh God, our salvation and all things are possible. And because of this, we praise you and thank you, which abounds to your glory forever and ever. Amen.
as we take the juice, let's um, make the commitment and have the desire that the Apostle Paul had to know Jesus Christ and nothing else but him crucified. It's the gospel and it's simple, but it is so powerful and gives me such joy. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, help us to see the value and to appreciate the blood of Christ and what it did for us and to realize that nothing of this earth compares to it. In this, your name we pray. Amen. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until. If you say go, no, we will go. If you say wait, we will wait. If you say step out on the water and they say it can't be done, 
will fix our eyes on you and we will come. If you say go, we will go. If you say wait, we will wait. If you say step out on the water and they say it can't be done, We'll fix our eyes on you, and we will come your way. Step out on the water, and they say it can't be done. We'll fix our eyes on you, and we will come. Let's stand for this song, please. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, bruised and broken by the fall. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pardoning love for all. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. He is able. no more. Come ye weary, heavy laden, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. Saints and angels join in concert, sing the praises of the Lamb. While the blissful courts of heaven sweetly echo with his name, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, here we now is the proclaim. Hallelujah, hallelujah, here we now is the proclaim. Be seated. Big thanks to Cade Smith for filling in for Lincoln and just want to say, Cade, you've been here about six months, is that right? Maybe a little longer. And Cade was recently um, acknowledged and, and honored with being voted the most eligible bachelor in Church of Christ in the Southeast. So ladies, I'm just saying, he's here, he's available. I'm telling you, he is a good guy. All right. We are wrapping up at least... I am uh, our series this week on the heart of compassion. Uh, next week, I'll be down with, on spring break with family down in Austin. Uh, so Tom Reynolds from the Saving Way is going to be here. And I know you guys uh, are in for a treat, and Tom will, will bring it. Uh, so look forward to that. 
Well, a few weeks ago, when it was cold, I mean, hadn't this been a long winter? I don't know about you, I'm ready for spring. You ready for spring? But a, a, a few weeks ago, when it was so cold, and a few days in a row it got down into the teens, the 10-acre pond across from our house froze over. And so the kids had a lot of cabin fever, and we didn't want them to get sick, but they were driving us nuts. And I said, let's go outside, and let's enjoy being out there and seeing everything. So we decided to, to bundle up and go out and play around uh, by the ice. It's always a little bit dicey. We decided to take the dogs as well, let them get out and play around. We are having a good time, and the ice was about three-quarters of an inch thick. So we are able to get the soccer ball out and kick it across the lake, which is kind of fun. Uh, and things were going great, but our afternoon kind of took a turn for the worse when one of the kids found a tennis ball and decided to chunk it out onto the ice. Now, the dogs weren't paying any attention to us until that happened. And then our golden retriever, Winston, uh, decided he was, who knew that a retriever would go after a tennis ball? Okay, and so the ball is out there, and so Winston goes charging out onto the ice, and it sounded like a timpani drum. Boom, 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 and we hear cracking, oh no, and he's doing fine until he gets out into the center, he throws on the brakes and digs in his claws, and just as he's reaching down to get the tennis ball, you know what happens, and he is stuck down in this ice, and so there's a big hole, and so we're calling to him, and, and the, the louder we call, the more he just kind of flailed and, and splashed around, and he actually tried to get out, and he put his paws on the edge of the ice, but when we would try to kind of awkwardly get out, it would just broke, it broke off another piece of the ice. So he was stuck. And so we didn't know what to do. And so poor Winston is just out there. And he's about 150 to 200 feet away from the, the closest place where he could get out uh, of the pond. So there was no way he was going to make it onto his own. He was going to make it out. And so this is actually some of the thought process that I was going through. Don't judge me, Okay. But this dog is out there in the center, and immediately I started thinking about uh, times in, in literature, in books that I had read, in movies I've seen, uh, and, and also newscasts where people die around the eyes. And I don't know why, but a, a wonderful life comes up, and, and so I'm thinking about George Bailey lost his hearing, went out to go get his brother, what was his brother's name? Harry, uh, Harry's out there. And so this is kind of going through my mind. So my first thought is, this is dangerous to go do anything to help this dog. My second thought was, Winston's 12. Big dogs, 12 to 14 years, that's all they've got, you know? He's out there, and I'm thinking, he's lived a good life. He would die doing what he loved most. He's a water dog, you know? And we still got Toby. Okay, third thought was, is this going to scar the kids? Are they going to have to go for years of counseling? My dad just left the dog, you know? Now, I'm also thinking about the neighbors. There are a bunch of that, that are around the pond. Am I going to get phone calls? I think we see your golden retriever. He's frozen solid. He's got a smile on his face and a ball in his mouth. I said, yeah, that's him. What are people going to think? Are they going to judge me for leaving this dog out there? So those are some of the things I'm thinking. This may sound crass. But these are some of the same internal discussions each of us have in our daily lives when we meet people in peril. Now, I'm not just talking about people you see on the side of the road that the car's broken down. Uh, should we stop or should we go? Well, we're kind of busy. Well, will someone else help me? What I'm talking about is we meet people all the time, don't we? And you start hearing their story, where it's a stranger that you meet on, on the airplane or, or someone that you encounter at school in your neighborhood, and you start listening to what's going on in their lives. And their marriages are falling apart. Their finances are wrecked. Their, their teenagers are living in outward rebellion to them, and they have no relationship with God, nothing to hold on to, and they're flailing out there. And you know that it, it, it may not happen tomorrow, it may not happen next week, but eventually they're going under unless someone jumps in to save them. So that's kind of what, what you start thinking about. But then you start thinking, what's my response going to be? And is it going to be risky it's going to cost me of my time, my talent, my treasure. All these things. Uh, am I willing to invest in this person to help them come to safety and come to a relationship with the Heavenly Father? And so you have to ask yourself in these tough situations, am I willing to display this heart of compassion? Well, in the familiar story of Jonah that we kind of 
looked at a little bit in the verses that our praise team read. You know, the, the prophet has this thriving ministry in the northern tribes of Israel. And he receives this call from the Lord, go to Assyria and preach the good news to the bad people of Nineveh. You guys are familiar with the story? Well, if Jonah heeds the call, it's pretty interesting. Uh, the most direct route between his hometown of Gath Heber in the land of Assyria would have taken him across the Sea of Galilee by boat where he would pick up on the king's highway and head north to Damascus and then up and over into the land of Assyria and finally the town of Nineveh. So that's the most direct route. Probably would have gone another way, but that's the most direct route if he had gone and done what God had called him to do. If you think of it this way, Jonah is at point A. His life is situated. He's good. He has a strong relationship with the Lord. He is well grounded. He has a thriving ministry. Things are going fine where he is, but yet God is calling him to point B. What's point B? It's risky. He could even lose his life going into this pagan nation as a Jew coming in, talking about a God that they have no relationship with. Is he going to risk this? Of course, Jonah starts weighing his options. He says, I certainly don't want B, and apparently I can't stay here. So he chooses C, to head in the opposite direction, head down to Joppa and pick up a boat heading towards Tarshish. And that's what he chose to do, not wanting to save the 120,000 people that are, are going to be lost there in Nineveh unless they turn. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. I want us to pick up the other story that the praise team was reading and kind of see maybe a different way for us to, to look at things in the story of Jesus. Well, Jesus in, in Mark chapter 4 is wrapping up a successful day. The crowds have gathered and, and he, he puts out a little bit into a boat and he's kind of preaching to the people. And, and the crowds listen to him all day long. And he's got enough ministry to, to, to handle him a, a lifetime. So he's there with all these people. It's been a good day. And so he decides later on that night, he's going to put out in, in, in the boats and to cross over to the other side. Now what you've got to understand is Jesus is pretty much ministering at this point in the same neighborhood where Jonah ministered. This is very close to his hometown. So he decides we're going to cross over. Well, if this is point A, the successful ministry that he's got here, what is his point B that he's leading them to once he and the disciples hop into the boat? If you look at the map, they're going to Gadara in the region of the Gerasenes, which is also a part of the Decapolis, ten cities of the Gentiles that have kind of outlined together. So that's where, where they're heading over, very much the same route that Jonah would have gone. So that's where, where they're going. So Mark, in his telling of the gospel, He's not saying this is just another detour that they're going to. But in reality, they're crossing over into the pagan realm. And Mark's going to bring out this whole spiritual warfare that's going on. And this is difficult for them to think about going over into this area. Because they're going to a land where pig herding is acceptable and demons will mass in legions. Well, that's the area they're going to. If you can imagine a disciples going up in and around at this lake, this is the part like they never went to. This is that house on the block that you walked around because your parents said, don't go anywhere near that house. That's where they're heading. Both times, Mark tells us that Jesus and his disciples cross over to this side of the lake. They encounter these deadly storms that they have to, to kind of row through and, and make it to the other side. So it, there's danger and peril on every turn as they're making their way over this other side. So the disciples have to be asking themselves, what are we doing here? Why are we? We've got enough among our own people. What's the need for us to cross over? Why are they doing this? Is there not enough ministry here? They hop in the boat. And Mark chapter 4 and verse 37 says, a furious squall came up. And the waves broke over in the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Well, what's Jesus doing? <laughs> what's he doing during this furious squall? The water's coming in. They're bailing out. Well, it says he's asleep. He's just like Jonah. He, he's ignoring all of this. And so he's also charged like Jonah with dereliction of duty. Don't you care if we drown, teacher? But unlike the reluctant prophet, 
who sought to escape his mission. Jesus has taken he and his disciples straight into it. They're going right to where God is, is telling them to go. Verse 39 says that Jesus got up and he rebuked the wind. And the original Greek is, is interesting, this choice of words, because the same verb and form is also used in Mark chapter 1 where Jesus rebukes the evil spirit there in the synagogue, if you remember at the start of, of Jesus' ministry. Ben Worthington makes the point in the Jewish way of, of thinking that these violent storms were seen as, as a natural holding cell for, for demons and spirits. And, and this storm was just incredible in this shallow basin there around the hills where the Sea of Galilee is. And so it's such a furious storm that even the, the veteran fishermen are terrified they're going to lose their life. So that's what's happening as Jesus is fast asleep during all of this. And so this is what's happening. So Jesus gets up and he says, keep silent. Literally, he says to the storm, be muzzled. Just restrict yourself. And that's what's happening. And, and the disciples are just blown away when suddenly it just goes calm. Psalms chapter 104 and verse 7 says, only God can do this and have control over what's happening with these storms and the weather. And so all this begins to happen. And the disciples are just witnessing this. And it says they were terrified. Literally, again, in the original language, they feared a great fear. Jesus calls them out for it. He senses what's going on. Mark chapter 4 and verse 40, it says, Do you still have no faith? What he's talking about here is, is, is a progression. You can imagine, you, they were introduced to Jesus and, and are kind of listening to his teaching. And, and they're kind of understanding some of this. But he says, your faith hasn't progressed to, to the point where, where you can say you truly have faith. And I, I want us to kind of camp out here for a moment. Because when we talk about people coming to faith, what, what are we talking about? Well, do you understand what the Bible says about this, this, and this? Do you understand this doctrine? And, and can you respond to that in a way? And that's part of it, certainly. But that's not what we see here. What, what Jesus is talking about is, is, are you willing, have you achieve, achieved enough faith and trust in me that God can allow you to function within the kingdom? See, if, if it's all just head and, and knowledge, then the opposite of faith is doubt. What he's talking about here, the opposite of faith is fear. Are you crippled from being able to do what God's calling us to do in the kingdom? That's what faith is. Faith is saying, even though I see all this around me, I'm willing to step forward in faith. It's not just about doubt. It's about pushing those fears aside. So that's what Jesus is doing. Well, this testing is not over yet. Turn over to Mark chapter 5, one chapter later. Well, the disciples are going to be facing a completely different scenario. The boats kind of pull up on the shore, right? And you can imagine uh, their, their fingertips are all wilty from being wet all night long. And they're exhausted from rowing and, and dealing with different sails and doing everything. Just surviving. They're flat exhausted when they pull up. And the boats make land. The first thing they notice is a large herd of pigs kind of up on the hillside. And they're like, that's new. Haven't seen that before. And then they kind of start looking and they see a, a, a pagan graveyard. And they're like, interesting. And then they start hearing something out from among the tombs. It starts, they start hearing shrieks and hollers and these schizophrenic voices going off. And suddenly they, they see this possessed man that starts emerging from among the tombs and starts coming out there. And I'm going to get too graphic, but the only thing he's wearing is just shackles and chains as this visual reminder of this inner turmoil that people have tried to squelch by outward restraint, but he's been too strong and too possessed. And so he's out there in all of his glory and just comes screaming out from the tombs. Then one of my favorite passages in all of the Gospels, it says, Jesus got out of the boat. Think about that. Jesus got out of the boat. What were the disciples thinking during this? 
What are the disciples thinking? Well, they start looking around and, and sensing all this. And they had to have been thinking back to Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 4, where it says, those who angered the Lord are those who sit in the tombs, spend the night in secret places, who eat the pig's flesh. Those are the ones the lords are angry with. And they're sitting there looking around going, okay, check, check, and oh, and check. All three of those things are happening. They're embodied in what's happening here. But Jesus gets out of the boat. There's one thing that I want us to kind of wrestle with and think about before we keep going in this story. You know, I'd always assumed that Jesus kind of needed a break. You know, they're teaching for a while. The crowds are always around him. And he's exhausted and just wants, you know, to get away for a little R&R. So they hop in the boat and he's so tired. He just falls asleep. But they have this unfortunate storm that comes up, throws them off course, and they just kind of land here. And it wasn't really in their plans to be doing this. Because, I mean, after, you know, after all, he's here to minister to the house of Israel, to the Jewish people. Well, they pull up on shore, and Jesus kind of encounters this crazy guy. He says, you know, this wasn't really part of the plan, but as long as I'm here, I'll help him out. I, I think if we look at Mark's telling of the gospel, we're going to see things otherwise, that the healing of legion was no mistake. I want us to kind of look at the pattern here, and I've kind of laid it out. If you can just imagine these different events that take place with the Jewish people. The first is the inaugural exorcism that I mentioned in the synagogue and, and the fame that kind of comes because of that. And then because of this, he has this popular ministry where he starts going out and it said that he healed Peter's mother-in-law and they started bringing people all through the night. He's healing people. He's driving out other demons. And then we see the symbolic healings. We have the story of, of Jairus' daughter, and we have the woman that had been bleeding for, for 12 years, and this whole inclusion on that story. And then finally, he reaches the masses, and in the peak of his ministry, in the feeding of the multitudes, in Mark chapter 6, we have the feeding of the 5,000. Okay? See if this pattern doesn't line up with his ministry to the Gentiles as well. We see this in, in the story of Legion, in in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, it's this inaugural exorcism where he's coming in saying, the kingdom is here, and let me show you what this means. And then we have this popular ministry in, in chapter 6, verses 54 through 56. He starts going around and healing people through every town and village he goes to. And finally, we have the symbolic healing of the Syro Syrophoenician woman. And then we have the feeding of the multitudes with the feeding of the 4,000 this time. So this becomes this pattern that's being set up. And Mark says, this is important. There's a reason why I'm coming over here. All this is by design. And while he didn't institute a full-fledged full Gentile mission, he sets the stage. What Jesus is trying to proclaim is, this is important. So let's pick up the story in Mark chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. When he saw Jesus from a distance... He ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus? Son of the Most High God, swear to God that you won't torture me. But Jesus has said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, For we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. So let's go over this again. They're on the non-Jewish side of the lake. They're among unclean Gentiles. And Jesus is talking with the, with the demoniac who lives among tombs and dwelled with an army of demons as pig herders look on. It's just incredible to take this in and to think of the disciples sitting in the boat just terrified going, what in the world have we gotten ourselves into? N.T. Wright says this of the situation. All the indications are that the Jew, that Jesus is surrounded by places, people, and influences that belong to the enemies of Yahweh and his people. Everything around him is unfamiliar. It feels unsafe. It feels dangerous. Have you ever found yourself in a place where you kind of feel like, man, I shouldn't be here? My freshman year in college, I got a, 
I was home for the summer, and I got a phone call from a friend who he was in college with me, lived over in Fort Worth, and he said, Brad, I, I got a concert ticket if you want to go. We'll have a good time. So I drove over there, and I said, who are we going to see? He goes, well, it's ACDC. I don't know if you're familiar with this group. And so I was like, okay. And so we went to this concert, and for the most part, it was just like a rock and roll show, till the encore. And it kind of took a satanic turn in the middle of this encore. The, the lead singer, Brian Johnson from ACDC, comes out, and he said, we're going to hell tonight. Who wants to go with us? And the crowd goes, like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, no, not me, you know. No, I'm, I'm out. This giant, uh, this giant bell comes down, and the drummer comes up and starts striking it. And the familiar guitar sound of Hell's Bells comes on, and then Highway to Hell. There's just all these demonic songs. I couldn't wait to get out of there. And I was sitting there going, I shouldn't be here. I don't feel comfortable here. This is the place that Satan has taken over. And so I quickly got in my car and thanked my friend for the concert ticket and took off and went home and went home and I opened my Bible, put on Amy Grant and started praying, Lord, don't let Satan grab a hold, you know. Uh, I shouldn't have been there. That's what's going on in this situation when all this begins happening. And so you start asking, should I be here? And you're like, no, I've got to get out. If that's true, why did Jesus head straight into this evil stronghold? Why risk life and limb for the exorcism of legion? What's going on here is the inbreaking of the kingdom. And Mark talks about this. He said Jesus is coming in not just to die for us, but to show what life in the kingdom is all about. It's all about helping people in need. It's about righting wrongs. It's about welcoming them into and giving them a taste of the kingdom to come. So all this is in breaking. And according to Mark, the real battle that Jesus is going after is a head-on war with Satan. It's not with Rome, which the disciples were hoping. It's not with the Pharisees and the religious leaders. Those are just symptoms of the problem. Jesus says, I want you to know from the very beginning, the kingdom is coming and Satan is my adversary. This is the first round. And ultimately, what's going to happen at the cross and the victory, this game there. That's why he had to go. Look at the imbalance of power in this confrontation. You've got Legion, who is a veritable army of evil, held up within this one man. So you've got all these demons, but yet they know, collectively, they're no match for the Son of God. And just bow before Him in, in proclaiming His deity and pleading, take it easy on us, don't cast us out of this area. But Jesus accommodates their wish and I just love this story. Can you just imagine that these pigs are up there and each one gets their own private demon and they start shrieking and down the cliff and down into the water and they drown. I just can't imagine seeing that. Well, the immediate reaction of the herdsmen that are watching is they're terrified. They're scared to death. They go into town and it says they start telling people what had happened to the pigs and what happened to Legion. And so it said people from the city and the country start the countryside start gathering around. Word spreads all over. They come in to see what's happened here. And what do they see? They see not only the pigs floating out there. They see the legion. This guy that they have gathered together on Saturday morning and wrapped in chains and left for dead and told the kids, don't go anywhere near the graveyard. They see him dressed in his right mind. They see the fruit of the kingdom being lived out. But they experience the same fear of the disciples when they see how incredible Jesus was. And they begged Jesus to leave the area. And the saddest thing that Jesus did. Okay, what is the implications for us? I don't think we're going to see this demon possession in pigs on the hillside tomorrow morning. What are the implications? I think we need to wrestle with this. Before we can talk about point B, where God's calling us to go. I think we got to wrestle with point A. We have to truly grasp what that means. What, what am I talking about here? In verse 18, if you read, Jesus is making his way back to the boat. The, the people have rejected. They're terrified. They said, you've got to leave. Go. Uh, it's just too scary. And as he's hopping into the boat, guess who else wants to go with him? Legion. He says, I want to go. I want to be a part. I want to 
to be with you. The former demoniac says, I want to go. But Jesus says, no, I want you to stay here and preach. I want you to tell your story. This is a guy that has only been wearing clothes for half an hour. And Jesus is sending him out on, his, on a great commission to go and, and spread the news. What, why is that? I mean, even his own disciples haven't been sent out. They've been traveling around with Jesus. They're not ready. Why is Legion? Why is he sent out at this point? The man has already lived into the heart of the gospel. He's experienced it firsthand. He's figured it out. But the disciples have yet to discover what it means for one's life and future to be holy in the hands of Jesus. He's seen it. He's experienced it. He's, he, he has a story to tell. He's made it to the other side. He's seen this new life that's opened up to him because of Jesus. Jesus tells him in Mark chapter 5 and verse 19, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, how he's had mercy on you. You know, I, I think sometimes we feel like we don't have all that good a story to tell, don't we? Especially those, raise your hand if you grew up in the church, so to speak. Yeah, and you're like, well, I've always been pretty good because otherwise I get clobbered by my parents. And, you know, while other people were out doing this, that, and the other, I kind of colored in the lines. And uh, then I kind of gave my life to the Lord, and he kind of has helped me out a little bit. To, you know, I, I kind of got that going for me. And we don't feel like we have that dramatic story to tell. But that's not what we see in Scripture, is it? That Jesus just helped us a little bit. Romans 3, 23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've got sin in our life. There's nothing we can do about it. And we learn in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 that the wages of this sin is death. We're lost. We've got no hope. Our, our goodness can't put us over. Any sin in our life separates us from the Heavenly Father. We've got to realize. And we've got to see ourselves as legion, as alone naked in our sin, uh, shackled, and, and no way of getting out of that. We've got self-inflicted wounds from the sin in our life, trying to do things our way. Satan has us bound up and left for dead. And we've got to see Jesus in that boat coming towards us, don't we? We have to see ourselves as in need. There's nothing we can do. And Jesus is making his way through the storm to get to us. It has to be. You know, each one of us in a moment's notice should be able to verbalize and say, this is what Jesus has done for me. This is the love that you've extended. This is the mercy you've had on my life. And, and if we can't vocalize that, we can't go out. God can't send us out if we don't have our story. If we don't understand what Jesus has done for us. That's our point A. And just stop here in the sermon. If, if you haven't gotten to that point, go back and read the story. Go back and read what Christ has done for us. You've got to understand what your point A is. Next, be open to point B. You know, when our dog Winston couldn't get out, I sent the kids to go get the kayak. And so they had to travel all the way around the lake and get over to our house, get the kayak, and go all the way around. So I'm watching Winston, and he dropped the tennis ball. I thought, okay, things are not good if he dropped the tennis ball. And he started getting a little bit panicked. And I realized the time for them to get back with this boat and the life jackets and everything Winston was not going to make it. He'd been out there for about 15 minutes of dog paddling and starts to start going under. And I thought, I've got to go in. And so I got over to the edge and started breaking through the ice. I knew I couldn't stand on it, so I had to break through the ice. And I got up to my knees and then up to my waist. And once I got to my waist, I couldn't get my leg up anymore. So I had to just start pounding. And I'm wearing gloves. I got my coat on, shoes, everything. And I just start breaking through the ice and breaking through. And it gets up to here finally was able to reach Winston by his collar and drag him out. It's cold. Got him up over the ice and, and into the path that I'd made and got him to the shore. And after he shook off some of the water, he just came and just kind of leaned up against me like, thanks, you know. I don't know. I, I would imagine most of us would do the same thing, the same situation. And I, I just got to wonder, if we're willing to just risk everything for an old dog out in the middle of a pond, why is it that we are hesitant to risk 
having a conversation with our son-in-law about spiritual matters, about talking with our Indian co-worker, our agnostic neighbor, our worldly lab partner in science. Why, why are we willing to risk having an awkward moment, not for an old dog, but for a person's salvation, to bring them to the Lord, the thing that's most important in their life? We've got to be willing, like we see in this situation, have total commitment, trust in the Lord, and to risk everything. You know, when opportunities present themselves, we've got to have faith in the Lord and get out of the boat like Jesus and display a heart of compassion for people. How did Legion do with his charge to go out and share his message to Jesus and him out? The next time that Jesus comes over into Gentile territory. I love this, Mark chapter 6 and verse 54. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region, carried the sick on mats wherever they heard he was. And whenever he went into the villages, towns, the countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces and they begged him to let the them touch even the edge of his cloak and all who touched were healed i think we have to realize unless we're willing to go out and, and spread the news of the kingdom people aren't going to know that there's hope for addictions that people in this community have conquered things that marriages that uh, appear to be heading towards divorce court that can be reversed we've got couples that can give their testimony unless we're willing to go out people don't know that there is love and forgiveness that is offered through jesus christ they feel like God uh, has just written them off. We've got to tell that story. We've got to say the kingdom that we've been welcomed into is different. Provide something. Don't believe the lies that Satan has you controlled with. That's what we've got to be about. This morning we want to offer an invitation. We invite you to come. It begins with your story in Jesus. It does. And hopefully it can begin today. And you say, I want to encounter a Heavenly Father that I know is actively pursuing me, that doesn't want to leave me in my sin, that wants me to have a relationship, that wants to die in my stead so that I can be reconnected with the Father. That relationship can be started today. For those of you that began that relationship a long time ago, but you relate more with Jonah and his calling when he was called to, to point B, you want to go to point C? God has a way of turning us around, doesn't he? Let that turn around begin today. I encourage you to trust him completely, to risk everything, and willing to trust him in all that we do. If we can help you today, we ask you to accept this kingdom calling. In Christ's name we pray. Come as we stand and as we sing. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, had it not been the Lord who was on our side, the anger of the enemy would have swallowed us alive. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, blessed be the Lord who would not give us up. Blessed be And we have a 
be seated, please. Thank you, Brad. Uh, very good. Very good. Very important message. Uh, just wanted to bring uh, to your attention a few news and no notes. All of these are in your bulletin. There are more details offered in your bulletin uh, than I'll offer here, but just wanted to bring to your attention. First of all, there will be no class this Wednesday night uh, due to spring break and the number of people we have out. Not only that, but also uh, the church office's hours are adjusted this week, and the church office will be closing early each day. I think it's 2.30 each day, Monday through Thursday, and then at noon on Friday. Also, uh, on the uh, 6th of April, there's our Mission Trip Madness three-on-three -three basketball tournament. Uh, details are in the bulletin, but that is that Sunday the 6th. Our youth are not going to Ecuador this year, but the money will be uh, put in account and saved for their trip next year in 2015. Uh, there's also on the 6th a baby shower from 1.30 to 3 uh, for Logan and Kelsey Oldham. So you can play basketball, go get a piece of cake, come back and play basketball. Um, the, a new Wednesday night classes start on April the 2nd. In the bulletin, there is a small section there showing what those classes are. Uh, good lineup. Uh, I encourage you to come on Wednesday nights. Uh, there's quite a good lineup, great variety. So there surely is something for everyone. Last, our ladies' tea will be on Saturday, April 5th. Tickets are $5 each, and they're on sale in the gym lobby. If you're interested uh, in helping out with the event, please contact Melissa Brown. pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for just the, the blessings that you've given us, Father. Father, we just ask that uh, you would bring those awkward moments to us. Father, that you would uh, give us the courage to step back and, and let the Spirit work in us. Father, keep us healthy and safe this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.